yes, because uh, Sister Susie has returned hey. to the show, uh, giving uh, Sister Holly a rest. She's gonna, she's gone on a Puritan course to, yes. um, <laughs> to become a little more stern. more judgmental. Yeah. Well, you're very yeah. welcome back, Sister Susie. Oh, it's good to be back. And uh, how's how's baby Ted? Um, yeah, he's good. He's uh, started nursery and bringing all of the germs home, which oh, is yeah, just good news. Good news, yeah, yeah. delightful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, also good news is that that's the drinks trolley. Yeah, which we which we missed. What's our drink tonight? Well, um, I went out for uh, Mother's Day yesterday. Yes, first one, and we had a very lovely bottle of pick pull which was very delicious, nice and dry and zesty. So I thought, why not have one of those today? Okay, so that's a pick pull, is it? Pick what pull. is that? It's what? a white wine oh, from right, France. Okay. okay, very good. Okay, <clears throat> very, uh, very French. Okay, yes. well, tonight, tonight's <laughs> confession comes from Eric. It's not a great one if you're eating. Oh. That's all oh. I'm saying. Thought you wel- welcome you back in style, <laughs> Sister Susie. Thanks. Dear Simon and the Munificent Massive, the story oh. I relate here of which I humbly beg your forgiveness, happened in the recent past. To be honest, it happened this last weekend. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Which is very recent. Recent past. Because some of these are like 50 years old. Before I continue, I must warn you and your listeners that it is a story best not heard at mealtimes. Well, it's going out at this time, so... Okay. Anyway. My good lady wife, let's call her Marge, not her real name, had invited a friend of hers to join us for Sunday lunch. As was customary... On such occasions, my wife then formulated a plan as to what meals she would be preparing. She's not one to buy in ready-made products. She insists everything must be made by her own fair hands. I must now explain that my wife is of an extremely focused disposition. By this I mean that once she's decided on something, that is what it will be come hell or high water. The concept of plan B does not, nor has it ever, featured in her thought processes. I think there's decades of experience yeah, coming yeah, out yeah. on Eric's <laughs> prose. She had decided to make a chicken pie with accompanying vegetables, this to be followed by a fluffy jelly. Her description, not mine. Fluffy jelly with ice cream. Ooh, lovely. Will all be explained about how you fluff a jelly. <laughs> all went well with the creation of the chicken pie. This was fortunately done whilst I was at the football on Saturday, so I managed to escape the house during its preparation. Having experienced the traumas and tantrums when things haven't gone exactly as planned, I was mightily pleased about this. My joy was, however, cut short on my return when I was informed that I was to assist her in making the fluffy jelly. The process was that after she had made the jelly by melting the cubes in hot water and leaving them to cool slightly, I was to pour this slowly into a bowl of evaporated milk while she was whisking it frantically. I was duly summoned to perform my duties. Where is the jelly, I asked. Out in your workshop, where it's cold, was the snapped reply. I went out to my workshop and I found it. Unfortunately, this is where things turned a bit nasty, as I wasn't the first to find it. Some slugs had managed to find their way into the bowl and appeared to have their heads, well, I hope it was their heads, in the jelly. But it could have been. It could have been. Oh. What way. backing into the jelly? They could have been. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> reverse. Yes, if you're a slug, you might Re- want to do that. Reverse. <laughs> Just like would a slug reverse or go ahead first? I don't know. Well, Simon, I can't lie. Blind panic set in. I knew if I told Marge, she would insist that the jelly was thrown away, and this would be followed by barked instructions that I should head out to the supermarket and purchase replacement jelly cubes. Unfortunately, having consumed a few beers at the football and a large glass of vino on my return, I was in no condition to drive. This would leave her with no dessert to offer. Any suggestion of my heading out in the morning to buy something else would have meant that she would wake me roughly half an hour... uh, She would wake me every half hour during the night fretting about what to do. Trust me, Simon, I had been there before and this was not something I wished to repeat. So I took the only step my fevered brain could come up with. I hooked the slugs out of the jelly bowl and threw them in the bin. Apologies to the Slug Protection League, if there is such a thing. (laughs) I then returned to the kitchen saying nothing about the slugs and proceeded to pour the jelly into the evaporated milk. Sunday arrived and the meal went well and the pie was delicious. When dessert was served, it looked lovely and was received by our guests very well. I had hoped to decline any of my portion, but I had to, so I steeled myself and tucked in. I'm sure it was just my imagination, but honestly, it did seem to have a strange slimy texture. (laughs) Which is not surprising, given the number of slugs. 
Uh, Our guests survived the experience, although what the long-term effects might be, who can say, because this has just happened. So oh, right. if it was Sunday lunch, okay. this was literally yesterday. So, Simon, I throw myself on your mercy and beg forgiveness, please, from your good selves and also from our guest. Everyone has remained nameless, uh, but that is Eric who sends in today's confession. Slugs in the jelly is not something that you would mess around with, I don't think, because uh. slugs have a little kind of a squirmy, slimy consistency, which they clearly will leave behind. And so I'm not sure this is going to go very well as far as Sister Susie's debut return is going to go. What would you say? Well, I've, I've got a few few things here, Eric. Yes. Like, it wasn't his fault. She put it in the workshop. His wife, Marge, put it yes. in the workshop. He could have gone immediately in and gone, hang on a minute, there's some slugs in here. And I guess it comes down to the fact that he didn't want the effort to go through and make another jelly. Now, that should really have been Marge's decision and not Eric. Right. And I just don't think I can forgive him for not bringing it up. Fair play to him, he ate it. So, you know, he did well. It sounds absolutely dis uh, disgusting. <laughs> um, rather from another it, does, it does sound foul. Um, but that said, as, as Suze points out, she was the one that left the jelly out. And the, if you don't want to have slugs in your jelly, don't put your jelly out where the <laughs> slugs are in the in the study. And uh, and also, does it really matter where the slugs are in the jelly? I don't think so. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, also, she was already whipping up the um, coronation chicken, was or whatever it was, the uh, cream stuff. Anyway, she was already whipping that up. <laughs> yes. And uh, you know, once you've started that, you can't stop. So you've got to. Pour in your jelly, slugs and all. So it's uh, and everyone it's was nature, fine. Really? It is nature, circle of life. Um, so uh, for that reason, going to forgive. Circle of life. Certainly, if the guest doesn't make it to next weekend. Yes, let, let's hope so. Let's the hope. delayed reaction yeah, yeah. of slugs poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Eric for his slug and jelly confession? Six one zero five four. Just before the news. We had Eric's confession, which happened yesterday. Mm. Very rare to have a confession that's committed and then immediately feels okay to uh, to send it in. That's what he did. It's Eric's slugs in the jelly story from yesterday. The people's verdict, here it comes. So Ruth says, forgiven. Who puts food in a workshop? Maybe the windowsill in the hall or a cool room would have been better. Fair. Plus, have a spur jelly as anything can happen. And jelly and ice cream for adults is so immature. Also, welcome back, Susie. Uh, Christine in Camberley says, I forgive Eric. Eric, purely for his bravery of confessing so soon to the crime. Hopefully his wife and their guests are not listening. But Robin Peterborough says, unforgivable. Reminds me of the time when I was taking a shower and saw some of my wife's new brown shampoo stuck on the side of the bath. Waste not what not, I thought, as I scooped it up in my hand, then realised it was a big brown slug. Oh, delightful. Yes. So there's another slug story Don't coming in straight away. No, in, you know, that's not a good thing. Their sliminess, not a good thing in no. your hair or on your head in any capacity. So uh, if you have a confession, we would love to see it. If we use it, you get a smart speaker. You send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. So it's 5.47, it's Confessions time, this is Greatest Hits Radio, and the very good news, in case you missed it yesterday, is that Sister Susie is back. Oh yes. And, uh, just, are you there? I am. Oh, just, yeah, I was just checking. Yeah. Because look, there's the drinks trolley, uh, just being, ah. trundling in, and we can select something else. What is it, what are you offering today from your trolley, Sister Susie? Uh, well, we're going with a non-alcoholic today. Okay. Um, it's a pale ale, gluten-free as well, um, and it's a Wish You Were Beer. Yeah, I wish it would be. Okay, that's it's very tasty. Yeah, All right, and right. nice if you're not doing the alcohol thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's very <laughs> useful. <laughs> useful information. Very of good. Uh, thank you. Okay, so today's confession originally was a twelve certificate, but I've oh. wrestled it down to a PG. Oh right. And it comes from from Sid. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sid. Simon of the Forgiving Collective. My confession takes us back to the turn of the millennium when I had a part-time maintenance job at St Custard's Preparatory School in Leafy, Warwickshire. This school was in a large... We haven't been at St Custard's for a while, No, we haven't, actually, so it's nice to go back. This school was in a large Victorian building. It was a surreal place to work, not only due to the architecture of the school, but because the headmaster, Grimes, obviously, was the spitting image of Basil Fawlty. Leading up to Christmas in 1999, the school music teacher, Mrs. Golding, thought it would be a good idea and in festive spirit to decorate the school library with coloured balloons blown up by the children in her woodwind section. These balloons were all round, 
but different sizes due to the varying lung capacity of the 10 to 11 year old pupils and were placed all around the top of the bookcases. Each balloon had the same message written on in black marker pen stating the child's name. For example, Theobald's breath or Tiddy's breath and so on. However, I noticed that strategically placed on the bookcase behind the librarian's desk, there was a very large pink balloon with the words Mrs. Golding's breath written on it and my mind went into hmm mode. Now, I'd had dastardly thought and questioned myself as to whether or not Mrs. Golding would appreciate my intended prank. I knew she had a very good sense of humour because a few weeks previous, whilst retrieving the Christmas decorations from the huge attic, I was walking along a loose floorboard and I stepped on the end of this board uh, that was overhanging the ceiling joist. And like a scene reminiscent of a Laurel and Hardy film, the other end of the board rose up and hit me in the face <laughs> and my size 9 steel toe cap boot followed by my right leg went straight through the ceiling and the soundproofing of the acoustic music room below. My fall was curtailed only by my gentleman's area colliding with the ceiling joist. <laughs> Once I had retrieved my right leg and got my breath back, as only the gentleman listening will understand, I peered down through the gaping hole that I had created and I saw a ten-year-old violinist in complete shock and bewilderment still trying to play, like the scene in Titanic, as her music teacher, Mrs. Golding, in complete hysterics, instructed me in her posh Surrey accent patch it up in your launch hour and nobody will notice <laughs> so there you go that's top <laughs> medical advice there from Mrs Thanks. Goldie yeah. so from her reaction I was certain that she had a she would see the funny side of my intended jolly jape in the library will everyone else however later that evening whilst locking up the school alone i entered the library and my eyes were immediately drawn to mrs golding's large pink balloon i tiptoed behind the librarian's desk and opened each of the drawers and sure enough there in the bottom drawer was an open bag containing the remaining balloons i couldn't help myself father simon my hand dipped into the cellophane bag and I started to imagine it was the burgundy velvet bag at FA headquarters and I was Rio oh, Ferdinand yes. choosing the balls in an FA Cup draw. Of course. Oh. But that's where the similarity ended because I kept replacing the balloons back into the bag until I pulled out a pink balloon to match the one above my head containing the exasperated breath of Mrs. Golding. <laughs> Whilst giggling profusely, I duly inflated the balloon to around the same size as the other one, and I attached my balloon adjacent to Mrs. Golding's one. And this is where it got out of hand. Using the librarian's black marker from the top drawer, I altered the message across the two pink balloons. So you'll remember it had read Mrs. Golding's breath. Yes. Well, I mm -hmm. removed the H and I added an S and, a, and then another S. Okay. In fits of guilt-ridden laughter, I, ask your parents, I locked up <laughs> the school and over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas, the least that I expected was for my illicit balloon to be removed or worst case scenario, to be called into the headmaster Grimes' office, Basil Falter, you'll remember, uh -huh. to initiate my instant dismissal. <laughs> but fortunately, neither of these happened. So, Father Simon and team, I beg your forgiveness not only to the music teacher for childishly imitating uh, biology, or to the... <laughs> and anatomy, or to the young violinist who was probably too traumatised to ever take up a musical instrument for the rest of her life, but obviously from the poor Basil Fawlty lookalike Headmaster Grimes, who up until his retirement never ever found out why he had a gaping hole in his music room and the acoustic ceiling being ruined. Your verdict would be appreciated from Sid, now in Devon. Uh, okay, well, uh, there's, there's some interesting tales going on there, I think. Uh, I think I suitably yeah, yeah, yeah. made that. No, yes. I think we're all there. It wasn't... Very well done. It wasn't mm. too uh, seaside, no. bawdy no. humour. End of the mm. pier. Anyway, uh, Susie is the voice of responsibility and respectability always. What do you say? Yes, Sid. I, should, I don't know what to think here. You know, there was no malice. You know, no one was harmed. However, I do think it was very, very childish. And in fact, I would expect better of someone who worked at a school. You mm. know, it's very childish behaviour. And I feel like you did deserve to, um, you know, injure your gentleman area for a little bit because mm. that was just silly and it wasn't needed. <laughs> so there you go. So your punishment <laughs> is deserves of his yes, gentleman deserves. area. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, brother from another guy. How very dare he be walking along and, you know, <laughs> fall through the... Yes. yes.
<laughs> fall the through poor the ceiling. Child. Yes, um, I mean it's, it's not his fault. The architecture it's in custards, is it? It's not down to him. It turns mm-hmm. out, you know, being uh, walking along and all of that happens. That's not fair at all. And also, I was very funny. Uh, the thing with the pink balloons and the Mrs. Golding's was breaths. It um, so very careful how I said that. Um, so yes, <laughs> and for that reason, I'm going to forgive <laughs> before I get into trouble. Yeah, mm. it's recovered just at the last yeah. minute there. Yeah, so well. You're going to undo all my careful <laughs> yes. yeah, handiwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Sid now in Devon? Uh, yes or no on the text 61054. First word is Simon. The people's verdict, please. 61054. First word is Simon. We had a confession uh, from Sid now in Devon, but he was a janitor at a prep school, St Custard's, of course, in Warwickshire. And it was a story of balloon inflation balloon writing and balloon vulgarity and titillation and uh, we get a people's verdict like this yes uh, Mitch says forgiven ultimately there was no nastiness here Mrs Golding probably found it funny and it was a great laugh hilarious confession Jessica in Worthing though says not forgiven it seems a bit inappropriate to write that on balloons for everyone in the school to see will no one think of the children that's so true and Tommy in St Ives says totally forgiven the thought of him falling through the floorboards is absolutely hilarious he deserved a laugh after that experience well if you have a confession we would like to hear it please you send it to confessions at greatest hits radio.co.uk uh, don't forget there's a brand new confessions podcast which is available with all the top confessions of the week plus some hits from the crypt and also the parish notice board everything mm-hmm. is there for you all fresh and fabulous every friday get it from where you get your podcast and the podcast supermarket uh, Matty sends in today's podcast. Matty, thank you for this. Father Simon, I was 13... This is a really... Uh, period technology is very much front and centre. Oh, right, OK. If Holly wow. was here, we'd have to explain a lot oh. of this. <laughs> I was 13 years old, and it was early 1986. Looking out of my bedroom window at the weather, a typical wintry, rainy day in northeast England, I decided that today was better as a stay-at-home day rather than a sit-at-school-in-damp-trousers day. My mam shouted up the stairs that it was time to get up. If I didn't want to be late for school, it was now or never, with a plan formulating in my head, actually. I went to the bathroom, sat down on the toilet, lid down, and shouted back at my mother that I had a poorly stomach and was now beginning to feel the beginnings of something unpleasant. My mam didn't believe me, obviously, as you don't, (laughs) <laughs> and I heard her stomping up the stairs only to stop outside the locked bathroom and continue to ask what was exactly wrong with me. With the aid of several sound effects, shampoo bottles being squeezed, <laughs> the, the toothbrush cup pouring water down the sink, and some others I was able to provide, I was able to convince her that I was in the midst of a spot of trouble once again. <laughs> there was no way I could go to school fizzing and gurgling like that. Uh, Mam agreed, and I heard her say that I'd have to stop off school and she would have to leave now to go to work so as not to be late for her bus with the sound of the front door closing i peeked outside the bathroom to check that the coast was clear it was so i headed downstairs to turn the fire on and the tv on mid 80s morning telly wasn't that good it was a thing called school's television where lessons and lectures were broadcast in the hope that this could then be shown in classrooms and give the teachers a break but hey ho i was off school watching tv and not sat in damp trousers in the school This led on to the moment of my undoing, the reason behind me asking for forgiveness, even if you regard faking the upset stomach. You know, I mean, that's bad enough, obviously. Mm -hmm. They say, Father Simon, they say idle hands are the devil's workshop. Proverbs 16, 27. And I am testament to that statement. As I sat in front of the fire watching school's television, I glanced upon my mother's sewing tin. The lid was popped, and I was soon fingers deep in bobbins of multicoloured thread, buttons, press studs, and a very shiny red horseshoe magnet. What fun it was picking needles up with the magnet, and then trying it on the sewing tin lid. This indeed was a powerful magnet. It also worked on the sitting room door handle, as well as Dad's pen that he'd left by the telly. Hmm, I wonder what it would do to the television. Oh, no. Oh, no. So I brushed the magnet across the TV screen and suddenly, where there'd been a man sitting behind a desk doing a lecture, there was now a big purple smudge. (laughs) Wikipedia tells me that this was something to do with me disrupting the electrons in the cathode ray tube or something like that. 
a big purple smudge which I hoped could be reversed by brushing the magnet the other way. The purple smudge <laughs> now got bigger and it was a big splodgy stripe across the center of the screen. And when I decided to use the magnet like, like an eraser thing, there was now diagonal stripes. The whole screen had turned purple. And that was when I saw my mother walking past our front door. <laughs> and panic, panic set in. The telly was switched off, the sewing tin lid went back on, and I made a beeline for upstairs and back into bed. That's the second time that bus hasn't turned up this week. I'll have to ring in work and tell him I'll be late. Are you okay, son? I heard a call from downstairs. I'm a bit better, Mum, thanks, I answered back. Oh, that's good, she replied. Oh, well, I might as well stay and have a cup of own. Watch a bit of telly until the next bus is due, <laughs> says oh, my no. mum. I heard the TV being switched back on. I heard the volume from the school's television programme I'd been watching a minute or so ago. But then I heard my mum. What's up with this thing? Have you touched anything downstairs? I'll try unplugging it, seeing if that gets makes it better. Anyway, so mum unplugs the telly, but it was no good, made no difference. The purple splodgy screen I'd left had not mysteriously repaired itself. In fact, when the repairman came to look at it, he said that the only telly he'd seen like this before was the one time he got called into a school where their television had been too close to their Van de Graaff generator. Oh, Let's Van hear it for the Van... Yes. Suddenly, lots yeah, of yeah, 70s yeah. kids are punching yeah. the air. Yes. Let's hear it for the Van de Graaff generator. Prog band as well. Yeah. Ma'am claimed for a new telly on our home insurance and got a bigger, newer unit, much better than the previous one I'd experimented on. She even bought us our first video recorder from the same shop, so she was happy uh, and everything was fine. As for me, my dicky belly cleared up the very next day, surprisingly, after the guilt of breaking our television gave me a big enough jolt not to do this sort of thing again. It's more than 40 years since I broke this television, and in this time I've only disclosed this tale to my partner and a recently retired work colleague. Father Simon and members of the congregation, after 40 years of holding on to this crime do you think you could possibly forgive me well i don't know about that 40 years is that beyond the statute of limitations for confessions <laughs> i don't know let's check it so it's matty's confession let's hear it for the cathode ray, ray tube yes. and the van de graaff generator uh, sister susie what do you say well when i was little um, we had a really big television in our in our like i, I mean not big screen but just it was like a brick Enormous, yeah. Um, yeah it was huge and um, my dad wouldn't let anyone go near it or touch it so if this had happened in our house my dad would would have not been happy um, however oh, I don't know what to do she got a bigger and a better one which yes. kind of makes me want to forgive him but he yes. did go through a sewing box and I bet that was a mess so therefore if someone had done that to my sewing box I wouldn't be happy so I'm not going to forgive Okay, uh, brother from another uh, So I'm definitely going to forgive and there's so many reasons why Number one, I mean didn't they learn a lesson with the with the magnet? It's almost like a physics lesson isn't it? Yes. The, the, the electromagnetic force with the with the magnet and the, and the TV screen and the, ray so tube. And, and the cathode ray tube so that's one Number two, they get a new telly better telly and they get a video recorder In 1986 that's that's amazing. Uh, but also, I'm definitely going to forgive just for the uh, foresight in using shampoo bottles to simulate toilet trouble. Uh, that sounds <laughs> fabulous. Well done. I'm going to remember that one. So definitely forgive me. Okay, well played, Matty. As far as Matty's concerned, maybe that's Matt staying together. Anyway, people's verdict, please, for Matty's confession with his cathode ray tube and his Van de Graaff generator. 61054. 10 minutes after 6. Uh, tonight's confession just before the news from Matty. He was skiving off school, fake stomach problems, quite ingenious there though, uh, and he ruined the family television with a very strong horseshoe magnet, the cathode, cathode ray tube and the Van de Graaff generator oh, yeah. and all that, and like, like the Northern Lights. That's yes, what it was an example exactly. of. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think maybe we all learned a lesson there. Anyway, the people's verdict like this. So forgiven, says Dallas from Bristol. Matty is an inquisitive person who has the skills necessary for imaginative Deception. Also forgiven, says Tim from Sutton Coalfield. I'm just imagining all the different bathroom items I could use to simulate toilet trouble. Ferris Bueller would be proud. But finally, Stephen in Rhonda says, not forgiven. The person who should be confessing is the useless repairman. This could have been fixed in seconds with a degauser, 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 degauser. Uh, yes, one of those. Yeah, one of them. Degosser. Degosser. Where is my Degosser? Anyway, whatever that is, yeah. he could have sorted it out, but he didn't. If you have a confession, we would love to see it and swap it for a smart speaker. Send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. So it's 5.46 and everyone is in a pretty thirsty mood. And uh, here comes the drinks trolley. And...
Uh, Susie's pushing that in. What have you selected for us uh, from the drinks trolley tonight, Susie? Well, St. Patrick's Day at the weekend, so slightly themed. Why not have an Irish whiskey, maybe a Jameson's, with a ginger ale? Oh, Lots of ice. ginger ale, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I have it without the ginger ale, just have it with an ice cube? You could, yeah. Thanks very much. I'll just I'll I mean, go with that. It is I don't like it neat, so I think the ginger ale makes it a nice long drink. Okay. I agree. Thank you. After the show, maybe. Tonight's confession comes from Master Chief. That's how it's signed. Thank you, Master Chief. Okay. Your Holiness mm-hmm. and Archbishops, Matt and Susie. Due to a big birthday recently coming to pass, I feel enough time has passed to finally confess my school day's transgression. I humbly acknowledge that in hindsight, my actions were ill-considered and potentially dangerous. Okay. And that is cor- a correct... Not forgiven. Description. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so to the tale. Back in the 80s, the school I attended had a cadet force. I mean... I was I was a part of because I had to be, and as such, we the cadets would go on trips and camps. On this particular occasion, whilst attending an army camp for a week, we went potholing. Yes, it's a potholing confession. Wow! There was a group. I don't think I don't think we've had one before. No, for good reason. <laughs> there was a group of about ten with a professional potholer and a couple of officers, otherwise known as the French and geography teacher. (laughs) Anyway, we're all kitted out with miners' helmets and lights with a battery pack the size of two bricks around our waist, and off we went. This group of lads, fun guys guys we were, uh, had within it a pair. This group of lads had within it a pair of what can only be described in polite society as a bully. Oh, right. And his equally annoying sidekick. This pair were bigger than the rest of us and took great delight, great delight in poking unkind fun at anybody that did anything that may catch their unwanted attention. They would also hide other people's gear for parades to get them into trouble and be particularly unkind to the larger, rounder group members when it came to physical activity. This pair had vexed me due to the aforementioned hiding of kit, which earned me press-ups in a puddle from the sergeant on parade. Hmm. meaning dirty parade kit that needed washing and ironing, as well as the embarrassment of completing 20 push-ups in front of the entire troop in a puddle. I had, in fact, had enough of these guys. Had enough, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to set the scene, imagine, if you will, a large open cavern about half a mile into the cave complex. There is a natural pool in a cave floor about 15 feet across and, according to the guide, deep and cold. The water was due to a hole about one metre wide in the ceiling of the cave, as well as the naturally occurring water within the cave system. We had come to a stop to regroup on a natural platform about ten feet above the pool and about the same distance under the ceiling. The platform was just wide enough for us all to congregate on whilst the guide checked that everyone was present. Now, as I waited, I noticed that there was an almost perfectly smooth natural stone slide from where we stood into the pool and who should be standing mere inches from the edge (laughs) but the bully boys my my plan formed in seconds we were tightly grouped so i made my way carefully and unnoticed to the safe side of where my victims i mean troop mates stood they were facing out looking over the pool and chatting once in position i bent down to tie my shoelace and as i stood i pretended to overbalance due to the additional weight of the battery pack at my waist i went to grab the person in front of me and then bumped into one of the bully boys who then stepped forward himself but into thin air and dropped and slid down the slide straight into the water below now your eminence at this point i was both elated and also disappointed as i'd only managed to get one of the boys to fall (laughs) however this quickly turned to full-on mirth as everyone turned to see what the noise was and started laughing at the boy now treading water in the pool below i was in truth feeling very proud of myself at this point especially as in the melee i had managed to sidestep back into the crowd of boys leaving no evidence of who had done what this however is not the end of the tale as it now takes a disturbing and therapy requiring turn oh As I mentioned before, there was a hole to the outside world above us, and this hole, as it turned out, had claimed a victim of its own, because as the boy spluttered around, his thrashing must have dislodged the body of a poor, unsuspecting (laughs) sheep. That had, that, had, that had fallen through the hole at some previous point and unfortunately drowned in the pool and sunk. This boy now popped up. This sorry, this body, this body, the sheep's body now popped oh up, God. not five feet from the 
boy who quite rightly thought he was now part of some Freddy Krueger type horror movie. At the sight before us, everyone stopped laughing and started screaming. <laughs> It subsequently took the adults in the group a good 15 minutes to regain calm control of the group and, uh, and fish the now hysterical boy out of the pool. This debacle led to the entire potholing trip being cut short. Before your greatness is past judgment, I need to further confess that there were no repercussions from the debacle due to the incredulous appearance of the sheep. The boy in question was certainly not himself for the remainder of our trip, no. which was appreciated by all. However, he did return to his old ways once we got back to school. I therefore ask for, not for forgiveness of the incident itself, but for any continuing trauma caused by the appearance of the poor deceased sheep, of which I'm sure there is some, as I still think about it 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Please spare a thought and prayers for the main protagonist in this situation, albeit unwittingly, poor Dolly the Sheep, who gave her life to bring this story to life. Amen. Yours in supplication, <laughs> <laughs> the Master Very Chief. Good. Well, I mean, it was it was quite an interesting tale anyway, When just when the bully boys, or one of them, had descended into this potholing lake. I mean, that was terrifying enough. But then to <laughs> dislodge the body of a dead sheep, mm. just emerging... Inches from your face, Sister Susie. What do you say? Well, Master Chief, I, do you know what? I was with you for quite a while through this because you know nobody likes a bully, um, and you know it's not fair. Um, but then the, the poor sheep, and I know you didn't cause the sheep. I definitely didn't expect it. And I guess, oh, it's a it's a tricky one. But I think I might forgive. Really, you're softer than Holly. I think uh, I think motherhood has softened you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I always was soft. Okay. Okay. So uh, so forgiveness, um, uh, brother Matthew. Well, yes. I, I mean, I'm going to forgive, but uh, I mean, obviously, I had no control over the dead sheep suddenly appearing. Although that is, as you say, like a scene from a horror movie. That goodness me. True. Um, and and taking your revenge during a potholing trip. Yes. Really? <laughs> I mean, there's a few things that could go wrong. I mean, this is clearly different times. Are you still doing school trips on potholing? That seems like a recipe for disaster. So um, yes, I'm going to forgive. I mean, everyone came out of it well, apart from the sheep. But you know the sheep had already died circle of life uh so for that circle reason, of life <laughs> registered of life. quite regularly now <laughs> so for that reason i'm gonna forget <laughs> okay you're right it's an unusual potholing confession and the dead sheep is nothing to do with the master chief or even the bully but your verdict please what do you say to master chief forgiven or not six one zero five four first word is silent just before six o'clock, we had a confession from the Master Chief about a potholing school trip. When half a mile in, he pushed a bully into a deep pool, dislodging a dead sheep, which now floated to the top. <laughs> Lots of screams. That's the end of the school trip. Everyone went home. The people's verdict. Here it comes. Definitely forgiven, says Sue from the Wirral. Haven't laughed so much in ages. Just what we needed to cheer up a gloomy, wet evening. Totally not forgiven, though, says Michael. Bullies are awful, and I understand why Master Chief felt the way he did. However, falling into a dark lake in a cave with a dead sheep sounds absolutely <laughs> horrendous. It does. It's a no from me. And finally, Alex from K Cambridge says, forgiven, nobody likes bullies. You never know what you'll find while potholing. I'm sure the bully was feeling sheepish. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. What <laughs> is it about you and puns? I love them. feel attracted to them. Okay, your confession, please send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk.